uh, today's presentation is about uh, the financing of uh, the First World War, and Jeanette is uh, uh, will be presenting. Uh, most of you are well familiar with Jeanette, but uh, for those who are not, Jeanette uh, is uh, Professor Emerita of Financial Management at the Open University, has been uh, many years uh, working for the Open University. Before that, he, he had a very prolific career uh, as uh, a guild analyst uh, and uh, and also worked uh, in, in Credit Lyonnais in France and also worked as a corporate finance advisor uh, in Rothschilds and Sons uh, and also taught finance at the London School of Economics. Uh, Jeanette's work is centered around many themes, uh, most importantly, history finance, corporate finance, and investment uh, management. Uh, she has been published uh, widely in journals, edited volumes and books, and she has also been involved in a major project uh, investigating women's wealth and investment uh, from 1870 to 1930. So I will give the floor to Janet. Danielle is going to chair uh, the session. Um, uh, Janet will be speaking about for about 45 minutes and then there will be a uh, discussion. Um, so I'm muting myself now. OK, is that me now? Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. I've got the two authors on this. Um, slide because Josephine was my co-author for many years and unfortunately died um, a few years ago and we were working on this paper when she died and I never had the heart to finish it so it's taken me some time to get around to it but this is the honour of her and the reason it's very important is because she spoke German and that facilitated our task enormously uh, and unfortunately I don't but I've, I've worked out how to translate the German on some of my slides for you. You have the next slide then. OK, so I'm going to talk about what the position was at the beginning of the war, World War One, and where war loan kicked in in financing the war. And then I'm going to compare German and British war loan and how they created them and look at war savings certificates. That's another area that we did before was we looked at small investors and there were lots of small investors in war savings certificates. Then I'm going to briefly look at propaganda and then what in a sense, compare and contrast Britain and Germany and who, who funded better. And I'm also going to look at the end of the war and see what the position was. And then finally, I've got a slide on lessons for the pandemic because it's topical. And then, in fact, it's quite amusing. At this precise moment, Neil Ferguson is giving a talk on the similarities between World War I and the pandemic on another webinar. Can I have the next slide? OK, so the quote on the left is from Lloyd George, who's basically saying that money is going to be very important. Funding the war is going to be crucial. In my judgment, the last few hundred million may win this war, he says. And this is where our resources will come in, not merely of men, but of cash. We have won with silver bullets before. We financed Europe in the greatest war ever fought. That's the Napoleonic War, and this is what we won. So basically... World War I came as a big surprise to the British. Nobody really expected war to happen. So what Neil Ferguson is arguing in his con contemporaneous lecture is that both of them were a surprise. The pandemic was a surprise and World War I was a surprise. But Britain wasn't in a bad state when going into the war. It had very low debt to GNP, half that of Germany's. Its debt was cheaper in the, was, sorry, at a lower interest rate in the markets. The London Stock Exchange was bigger than New York and Berlin combined. Germany, on the other hand, had a very active savings bank um, system, but they paid 5% on saving bank deposits and Britain only paid two and a half. And that, that became quite important later on, I'll explain why. The British critiques of German financial strength, the, the Germans said, look at our savings bank system, it's much better than yours. And the other thing about the war was that the Germans were prepared. They were prepared in various ways, but certainly financially, they had this system of loan banks, which were ready to lend people money to buy war loans. 
So they were actually very organized in terms of financing the small investor. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the issues that everybody talks about is how do you finance a war? Do you finance it with taxation or do you finance it with bonds? There's an argument about which generation is going to pay, which generation is going to pick up the bill. But Germany had planned to finance the war with bonds and it decided to, to, to issue 10 year bonds. Well, they had a maturity of 1924, which was 10 years down the road, but you didn't, they didn't have to redeem them at, at 1924, they could hold them for longer. And so they decided to fund with bonds and they had a plan of how to do it. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The aim of both sides was to minimize short term loans because the last thing you want to do is run out of money and have to refinance. So the aim was to issue long term bonds to push away the cost of the war. And the reason the Germans did that was because they thought they were going to win. And when they won, they were going to get lots of extra land and what resources and be able to pay back the loan very easily. The other thing that affected Germany was they had a very um, undeveloped income tax system. It had only really started on a statewide level in 1913, so they couldn't really do anything very dramatic with income tax. But they did have customs duties and so on, and they introduced ex excess profits duties. So companies that made excess profits because of the war had to pay penal tax rates to the government. And the other reason that they wanted to issue war loan was there was a lot of gold hoarded by people like farmers who didn't want to give their gold to the government. So by issuing war bonds, they persuaded people to hand in gold, which they could use to buy supplies and so on. And they got hold of the gold that way. But in fact, after the war, the, the, the proportion of bonds and tax wasn't really that different between the UK and Germany, partly because of excess profits tax, because Britain brought in excess profits tax as well. Now, Britain had no plan for financing the war. Ferguson argues it came as a great shock. And he argues that it was, was it a black swan or was it a grey rhino? He, he thinks, in fact, it wasn't. He thinks it was a dragon. I think it's called a dragon. I've lost the piece of paper. It was a dragon, sorry, a dragon king, that's it. I can't read my writing. So a dragon king is something that's likely to happen, but in a sort of, not in a normal distribution sort of way. It's something that comes out of left field. So what did the, they do? They, the war was in August 1914. So they almost immediately, with their first budget, raised income tax rates to 30% and super tax to 22.5%. And you can see that was much higher than the 1913 rates. And by the end of the war, there were 3.9 million people paying income tax. Now, what that meant was that more people were paying tax, but they didn't really put swinging taxes on the very wealthiest. They were concerned that high tax rates would not be tolerated after the war. And they had this strange, McKenna, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, had one of the strangest principles. He thought all you needed to do was to raise enough from taxation to cover payments into the sinking fund, that's repay, capital repayments of debt and the debt service charges on new borrowings. So he thought the rest would be funded from bonds. And as the war progressed, they got more and more people arguing that it was unfair to do that and they should do, use taxation more. But he, he didn't agree. And the other thing that happened was that they wanted to, to issue bonds because they wanted to clean up the spare money that was swashing about the economy because people were earning higher wages in munitions factories, wives were getting allowances from the, when their husbands were soldiers. So there's quite a lot of money in the working classes and they were worried about inflation. So they thought that bonds would soak up this excess cash and Keynes was very keen on that. Now, the, th the thing that's quite interesting is that war loan was seen as an indication of confidence in ultimate victory. So everybody was very, very keen on if they did issue bonds into the market, their, their home markets, they had to be seen to be a success. They had to be seen that the people were behind the government and prepared to put their last penny 
in to invest in bonds because that meant that they were they were sort of in, on the moral high ground, as it were. Can I have a next slide, please? Okay, so there's a book called Internal War Loans of Belligerent Countries, which gives 15 different countries and all the bonds that they issue to their domestic market. And you can see that there, there's quite a lot of these countries. And the interesting question for me as a bond analyst, who I used to work in bonds, is how to structure the, the loans. What was the best way to do that? Now, there are various things you can choose when you're issuing a bond. You can choose the interest rate, the issue price, the yield to maturity, when it's going to mature, whether you should have a range of maturity dates or just one, how long you should open the bond issuance for, how much you want to raise. And then there are all sorts of other complexities, like should you have a sinking fund? What about taxation? What about rights to convert the bond and so on? Could you pay by instalments? How did you distribute it? So there were lots and lots of ways that you could think about designing war loans. Um, and I'm going to show you that the way that the Germans did it and the way that the English did it was very, very different. Now the next slide, please. OK, so the Germans had this plan and their plan was to say we're going to issue the same bond every six months for as long as it takes. Now, they chose 1924, as I said, because they, that's when they thought they'd have won by a, on a pessimistic basis. But there was no they could re redeem it in 1924 or after. So the government had the option of when to redeem. So if it took longer, they still had the money. They issued it at a 5% interest rate. And they priced them close to par. And you can see the, the dates. They had nine war loan at regular intervals. They had 39 million subscriptions. They had a population of about 67 million, something like that. But the bonds were very straightforward. Simple coupon, simple maturity date, and simple price, close to par, no conversion rights, nobody worried about taxation. And they were funding at about gross redemption yields of about 4.6 to 5.5 percent. Now, what's interesting is coming into the war, Germany was 1 percent higher interest rate charge than the UK. But by the end of the war, they were both on around five. So the Germans managed to fund at the same rate as the UK, despite starting from a worse position. Next slide, please. OK, so. The way that they looked at these things was that you looked at the interest rate, the issue price, the approximate yield, how much they raised. And you can see in dollars how much they're raising, one billion, two billion and so on. And people started looking at the numbers to see about the success, because in Parliament, the British would talk about how badly the German loans were doing. And in Germany, the Germans would talk about how badly the English loans were doing. So there was quite a lot of competition. Now, the German war loan, if you look at these the numbers, they go up over time. There's a bit of a wobble in 1916 and for the last war loan in 1918 when they were facing defeat. But only war loan three for Britain, which I'll come to in a minute, is of the same order of magnitude in terms of subscribers in absolute terms. So the Germans really did get people out there. And for their best issue, both Britain and Germany achieved one in 10 of the population um, buying war loans. Britain only for one war loan, Germany for two. But per capita, Germany raised less money than Britain for the, each individual issue. But it's probably because the British decided to separate out the small investor and give them a different investment product because they, it was felt that war loan was not necessarily suitable for everybody. So the, the Germans had a one size fits all bond and you bought it in small amounts or large amounts and you kept on buying the same bond. Whereas the British said, we're going to tailor make securities to suit people. And the reason that they did that was because the first loan that they issued, the Brits, was an absolute fiasco. Can we have a next slide, please? Okay, so this is the British war loan. So there were three key British war loans. The first one was in the 
immediate aftermath of the declaration of war. And they decided they wanted to raise 350 million. And they went to the city and the city said, well, you can't issue an undated bond like consoles, which was the benchmark government bond, which was a perpetuity. You can't do that because people won't trust you enough. You have to have some kind of maturity date. And they innovated and they had a range of maturity dates, 1925 to 28, only three years. But it, they felt that would be better than just one single date. And the coupon on it was only three and a half percent because it was being based on console. But that was, you know, at the time they issued it, the stock exchange was closed. People had only just got out of a major liquidity crisis. Life was tough. So it was a very, very big flop. And in fact, the government lied about how much they'd raised. And they, they were reduced to getting the chief cashier of the Bank of England to personally apply for billions of bonds to make the books look good. So it was, a, as Robert, Richard Roberts called it, it was Treasury's blackest secret. So that was a real problem. They, they'd messed up the first war loan. Whereas the, the Germans, it had gone smoothly into, um, into action. Now, war loan two came in June 1915, so six or eight, seven months later. They raised the coupon to 4.5. They broadened the maturity to 1925 to 45. They gave people a slight bonus if they paid it in instalments. And they introduced this concept of conversion rights, which they picked up from the French, which was, in order, if you think you're not getting a good deal on this bond, we give you the option to convert into another bond that we may issue in the future, which I may, I may have better terms. So you'll never be sold a dud. You can always swap into the latest, perhaps more generous bond. And they also tried for the wall end too, to access people because people normally bought gilts in banks and stock market and things. So they were trying to get ordinary people to buy them. So they gave them vouchers, there were workplace schemes, post office prospectus. And they, they started a war savings committee afterwards because it really didn't work. So the War Savings Committee made some recommendations and they issued work um, war savings certificates, which I'll come to in a minute. Now, War Loan 3 was the great triumph. It was 21 months after War Loan 2, so there was a long gap. And there were long gaps between the war loans because the paperwork was so complicated. So if you allowed people to convert, you had to wait till they got all their paperwork sorted out and their interest payments on the previous one to be able to convert them into the new one. So the Bank of England was very, very behind on its bureaucracy. Wall loan three was 5% coupon, and that was psychologically very upsetting because it, it, was, it was very expensive, especially as they issued it at 95, um, with a quite long maturity date again. Now, Interestingly, they issued two war loan three. One was 4% tax free and one was this 5% one. And nobody took the tax free one. 2% of the uptake was tax free. And the, the feeling is, and um, Norma Cohen has written on this, says that people basically evaded tax because the thing that they did was in the old days when you got your interest, you, you, had, tax, you had tax taken off it before you got the interest a sort of withholding tax, tax at source. And what they did with War Loan 3 was they said, we won't take tax off. You can declare the tax yourself and pay it. And remember, tax rates were reasonably high. And so there's a belief that they lost a lot of taxation because people bought it and then didn't declare it. The other thing that they did to make the bonds attractive was they said you could pay death duties using these bonds at par. And since they were probably trading at 95 or less, you were getting some, some discount for paying your death duty. So then we come to war saving certificates and let's have a look at that one. Can you turn the page please? Oh, sorry, we're just looking, I'm just looking at the, the numbers on the British war loan. So you can see in the middle, the sort of slim uh, oval, the amount raised. So the first one, they theoretically raised 350 million, but they didn't. They raised something like 111 million. 
The next one, they managed to raise 616 million. And the final one, they raised 1,000. And that came to, and they claimed that the number of subscribers went up from 100,000 to 5.289 million. And the way that they did that was they said, we were going to look at the war saving certificates. We sold 5.6 million war saving certificates. We assumed two per person. So that's 2.6 or 2.8 million people for holding war saving certificates, which gets our numbers up to 5.289 million. They were desperate to get the number of people subscribing to higher than the Germans because they wanted to compete. So what people were looking at when they were competing was the number of subscribers overall, the ratio of investors to the population. So you can see it, it, the wall entry gets down to one to nine. The amount per subscriber in pounds and dollars I got here and the amount per head of the population. So they, they could look at a number of ways of, of measuring success. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, so what I think is quite interesting is this committee met and said, how are we going to persuade the, the small investor to invest in government bonds? They don't like war loan. What can we create for them? And that the underlining show that there are really three things or four things that make that the small investor wants. They recognise, first of all, it had to be simple. Then he wanted to be assured that he could get his money back, that the, the capital value would not depreciate. They wanted to be able to access their money for a rainy day in case, and they didn't want to be fobbed off with a worse return than the large investor. And remember, the savings banks in the UK were only paying 2.5%, and war loans were paying around 5 but One of the things the government was upset about was worried that people would just take all their savings bank money at two and a half and put it in at five and raise their interest cost with no extra funding. But in fact, that didn't happen. Um, some people kept their money in savings banks, even though they were getting a lower rate of interest. But with the war savings certificate, they created a product which satisfied all these criteria. Can I have the next slide, please? So the basic idea was you invested 15 shillings and sixpence and five years later you got a pound so the, that worked out at a slightly more than five percent yield you could access the money before maturity but you didn't get any interest if you did and there was no capital loss because you you always got more back than your 15 and six so it worked extremely well and i don't know if any of you recently came across leases the lifetime investment savings well, that, they were based very much on war saving certificates, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. They, those are the criteria that suit small investors. They were marketed very heavily. You can see that Joan of Arc was involved. Um, and just to say that during the war, people suggested premium bonds as another alternative, but that happened in World War II, not in World War I. And these war saving certificates, although there were millions and millions of people buying them, they raised a total of 341 million which compares with one billion for War Loan 3. So you can see that there were a lot of small savers. The other thing that happened is that they were tax free up to £250 and later £500. And the middle classes all took advantage of that. And so it didn't quite democratise as much as, uh, as was expected. Thanks, side, please. OK, so what we look at now is the propaganda. So how did how did the Germans manage to sell all these bonds? Well, they all rallied together and they, the Reichsbank organised a media campaign and there were films, rallies, newspapers, everything. And they had a national system with local agents and they produced a lot of material, specific materials for persuading farmers, industrialists, financiers to invest. They had a rhetoric of hero heroism, history, empire and expansion, and they marketed investing in bonds as a form of public service. The other thing that they did, which is quite interesting, is they 
Um, some people, their wages, 10% were paid in war loan. So it was quite useful to have this very simple war loan that everybody had and kept on having more of because they were able to persuade people that their salaries were just as good in war, war loan than in cash. Um, they produced a 60-page guide with model speeches, what to say on the doorstep and pictures to use. And they even influenced arithmetic classes in school. So one question was, how much would the third war loan weigh if it were made up of 20 mark pieces? So um, they, everybody got involved. Next slide, please. Now, this is a very interesting propaganda because it's they use statistics in a way that the British just didn't. There were no posters in the UK which had which were giving numbers except this comparison of, of war loan, which I'll show you in a minute in the English side. But, but the Germans were adamant that they were just better at most things. So they had um, population. We look at these pictures. I think it's population. Um, what was that one? Eh? Is it the children? Then the next one is how much land is used. Then what what our animals are worth, what our agriculture is worth, how much coal we mine, how much we've mined in the last 25 years, what our iron ore deposits are, how much steel we make, and potash. So the three countries that they compare are Germany. England and France, and you can see them on the top left there. So they used a lot of this to, to another one. They they looked at um, the number of illiterates, who, who spent the most on education, who spent the most on pensions, and also who had the most Nobel Prize winners. So they were very statistics oriented. Next slide, please. This one's even better. This is a, a poster for the ninth war loan, which is in 1918, secured on the achievements of German courage. So they had two pillars. One was talking about the war and one was talking about the economy. So on one pillar, they go on about how, their military successes, how many prisoners of war, how many kilometres of territory were occupied, how many enemy planes were shot down. And on the other pillar, they look at things like dairy produce, railway network and so on and underneath you can see there are their resources of coal and 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 iron and other useful things for making guns so they very much tried to prove to the people that they were the bigger and better at most things and also it was a better country to live in because you got better pensions and so on next slide please British war loan propaganda was just as pervasive, but it, it had a different tone. So there were posters, rallies, newspapers, cinema. 2,000 cinemas showed slides about buying war loan. They used advertising experts, particularly Hedley LeBar. And Hedley LeBar did the war loan two uh, marketing strategy. And he also ran a thrift campaign and he also did the, um, the encouraging people to, to enlist before it became compulsory in 1916. There was a campaign to recruit. So he was very, very influential. The thrift campaign is interesting because I'll show you some slides, some posters, but that was uh, tied to the inflation beating argument that if you could persuade people to save, and not spend money on flashy goods, then inflation would remain low and you'd get money for funding the war. So they used persuasion rather than docking people's pay with war bonds like the Germans did. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer sent a mimeographed signature letter to 650,000 households. The Inland Revenue tried to persuade 42,000 of the wealthiest households to subscribe. The Advertising Advisory Committee saw 60 journalists a day to try and persuade them to say nice things about it. They showed the War Loan 3, sorry, at 2,000 cinemas. 
They produce 8 million prospectuses, 20 million application forms, and 8 million conversion forms for all owned three. So it was a big, big effort. And the themes were, the British were very keen on the fact that they'd issued the biggest, the biggest loan. And so they, they, they were emphasising the loyal population doing their bit for the war. They were talking about financial prudence. It was prudent to put your money in, in uh, war loan because it was safe. The government would never default. It was patriotic and also it was thrifty. And one of the interesting things is that, it, that class reared its ugly head here because it was the poor who had more money because they were getting better salaries in munition factories and, as I said, these extra allowances. And more people were working, you know, people who'd retired or younger people were, were working in a way that they wouldn't have done perhaps before. So they, they decided to try and target these people who had this extra money to persuade them not to spend it on furs or pianos or whatever and to spend it on war bonds. Or war bonds. But there was a lot of criticism in the press that the rich were not exactly holding back and they were a very, very bad example for the poor. So there was a very famous society wedding which took place in 1915 where there was a great shock that they were sending bad signals to people saving their sixpence a week. So that they just wanted their success at selling war loan compared with Germany, but they didn't do statistical comparisons like the Germans. Next slide, please. OK, so this is an example of a war loan rally. So on the left, I've got the top, that's Trafalgar Square, where they're all rallying for war loan in war loan three in 1917. And at the bottom, I've covered it, but that's Berlin. There's a packed theatre listening to people talking. Now, the latest subscriptions is quite interesting because one of the things that you did was you declared in public, if you wanted, how much money you were giving to war loans. So you notice that Swan local authorities had a lot more money in those days. They've got Swansea Corporation giving 3.1 million, Glasgow Corporation giving 2 million, and then companies, railway companies, insurance companies, local companies would give money and then it would go in the paper and they would be seen to be patriotic. And there were competitions as to which city could give the most money. And there were prizes. But the bottom left one is quite interesting. So the bandmaster of the Coldstream Guards will give a demonstration of German hate as expressed in German music. During an interval, he will appeal to the citizens to support the war loan. He proposes to ask them what is their reply to the German hymn of hate. And he will tell them there is only one reply. And that is to walk into the mansion house and invest their last shilling. The band will afterwards be entertained by the Lord Mayor. So it, it was quite um, active, as I said, and very, very involved everybody, every stratum of society. OK, thanks. Next one. So this is the kind of thing. So there was a pamphlet produced when uh, when War Loan 3 came out. And the, the pamphlet's called The Largest Loan Ever. And it makes these comparisons uh, between British war loans and German war loans. And again, Bona Law, who was the Chancellor of Executive in 1917, compares, I should like to compare the figures of this loan, that's War Loan 3, with the German loan. Their biggest, which was the third, was 608 million, which is surpassed, as the House will have noticed, by this loan to the extent of nearly 400 million. What they never mention when they're comparing with the Germans is that the Germans did nine big issues and they only did three. I mean, they issued other bonds as well, the Brits, but they, they tend to always compare themselves with one German loan, which seems a bit unfair. It is interesting and instructive to note that the German loans have successively become smaller while ours have, had, have increased. I think if you look at the numbers, that's not strict, strictly true. But anyway, it boosted morale. Next slide, please. OK, so this is an example of appealing to the working class. So the new capitalist says he's going to give a dollar to take his stake in the country. And the, the editor of The Economist claimed that as a result of all this army of 15,000 devoted and disinterested workers and the increase to 16.75 million holders of government securities in 1918 had been a, a big success. So 
I think it was generally felt that the, the war savings certificates were very successful because they did target people who wouldn't normally invest. They got their 5%. But in a sense, it, what, what's interesting is that in America, they, they had the same idea and they sold the same kind of bond to people there. And that liberty bonds, they were called. And after the war, you could argue that those people then invested in stocks and shares and you know, contributed to the bubble in 1929. Whereas in, in the UK, these people didn't then go and buy shares and, and bonds in the market. They stuck to savings and government products. OK, next slide, please. Now, this is the thrift campaign, which is quite nice. So are you helping the Germans when you use it? You are helping the Germans when you use a motor car for pleasure, when you buy extravagant clothes, when you employ more servants than you need, when you waste coal, electric, light or gas, and when you eat and drink more than is necessary to your health and efficiency. Set the right example. So, you know, even to dress extravagantly in wartime is unpatriotic and bad form. And it's quite interesting because there's a lady I'm writing a paper about who's um, a, a shareholder in lots of companies, particularly fashion companies in, in London. And she goes around during the war saying that they shouldn't stop, they should buy dresses because what's going to happen to the industry that makes the dresses? If they don't keep on buying them, companies will go bust. So there's a sort of paradox, which in a sense we have with the pandemic today. So working class households were reluctant to see the well-to-do stuffing themselves and the well-off were wasting money on clothes, stock exchange speculation and parties, according to The Economist. And there was a, but the punch cartoon was joking about the working class. They have a picture. I haven't got the picture, I'm afraid. Working class munitions worker smoking a cigar in a expensive suit, telling a friend he's just bought a piano. And there was a lot of patronising that, you know, the poor were buying pianos, but they didn't know what to do with them. There's a lot of so there, there's beginning to be class differences between who was winning in the war and who wasn't and who was benefiting and who was sacrificing. And that, um, as we see, was partly affected by war loan. Next slide, please. Yeah, sorry, Jeanette, just letting you know that there are 10 minutes to go, if okay. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so. What happened afterwards? So by 1918, both countries ended the war with huge amounts of debt. So Britain was about 150% when it started from 30%. Both countries had a flagship war loan. In a sense, it, it happened in two ways. One was to do the German approach, which was to issue the same war loan repetitively. And the other one, what the Brits did was they said, OK, we're going to have more and more generous bonds. War Loan 2 was more generous than War Loan 1. War Loan 3 was more generous than War Loan 2. But because of the conversion rights, the right to go to go convert into the more generous one, everybody ended up in War Loan 3. So you can see on the left there, where I've circled, it's £2 billion pounds in War Loan 3. And everything else is pales into insignificance. So War Loan 3 on its own represented 32% of outstanding domestic war debt in 1920. And if you think about it, you were getting 5% and people kept on buying, converting into it all the way up to 1929, which was the date at which it, you couldn't do it anymore. And it was in 1931 that it was converted into a 3.5% debt to try and reduce the costs. Now, yeah, there's the impression that in Germany, inflation ruined everything. But actually, if you look at the figures, they were issuing war loan in Germany up to the end of 18. And inflation didn't really take off until the middle of well, 1920. So there wasn't that much difference between the impact of inflation on the bonds in Germany or in the UK. The mark was a little bit depreciated compared to sterling. It went down about 10% in relative terms, but it wasn't a lot. So in the end, both countries ended up with about the same cost on debt, which in a sense is a win for Germany because Germany started off 1% lower and ends up paying about the same. So people felt that British investors with War Loan 3 were given an impossibly beautiful dream. 
And then, of course, in the, the war loan that the Germans held became worthless with hyperinflation in 1920 onwards. Thank you. Next one. OK, so this is Lord George's memoirs, which came out in 1938. And he's basically whinging on and blaming McKenna and Bonalore, Law, the two chancellors of the Exchequer, of having thrown money away by this war loan three. That loan was issued at 95, bearing interest at 5%, and over 2,000 million was raised at this penal figure. The same rate governed subsequent borrowings, which by the end of the war had added a further 4 billion to our national debt. It cost the country a dozen years of remorseless deflation and concomitant depression to bring interest down, rates down again. And throughout the, the interval, not only was the country taxing itself to pay a sum ranging at one time as high as 100 million a year, more than it would otherwise have done, but the high yield of the gilt-edged government security kept up rates all round, made money dearer for all enterprises, industrial, commercial and national. It would be hard to estimate the sum total of the price paid by the nation in every department of affairs for the decision of Mr McKenna in 1915, that's War Loan 2, to increase the rate of interest paid by the government on its wartime borrowing. His action had, I like this bit, his action had, no doubt, the fullest authorisation from the leading circles of banking and finance. But the country has since then had ample evidence that these circles are by no means to be reckoned as infallible advisers. So he blames War Loan 2, which actually ended up with a yield of 5%, as having got everybody used to it. And in fact, the government peaked at an exchequer bond, which is a slightly shorter term bond, at 6% coupon. So it's true that it did have a knock-on effect. All the other loans they raised, which were called national war bonds, and there were two they issued after the end of the war, all of them were at over 5% yield to maturity. And the interesting question is, did did they have to give that? Some contemporaneous people say that actually people didn't even look at the coupon in the end. And one of the things that that happened after the war was that there were still all these conversion possibilities. And they actually issued a conversion bond in 1921, hoping people would convert into it. But a lot of commentators said that the British didn't really understand these bonds very well because they were priced by looking at the coupon over the price. And that gives you what's called the running yield or the interest yield. But nobody really talked about the yield to maturity after the event that you can calculate it and so on. But when they were marketing, they didn't really explain how it worked when you paid 95 and it was 5% coupon and there was a variable maturity date. They're actually quite difficult to value. And Norma Cohen's found, looking at the 1920s, that investors were very suboptimal in converting their bonds from bond A to bond B to get a better deal. They often didn't understand. And there were quite a few people who really lost out by not converting because they didn't know how to do it. Now, the, on the right, I just think this is incredible. I was, I was, you know, that George Osborne just paid back World War One debt about um, 2014, I think. He paid some one of the, the perpetual ones back. But Stanley Baldwin gave a quarter of his personal fortune to pay lo off war loan. In 1919, uh, £160,000, which was a fifth of his wealth, he gave anonymously, although somebody discovered it later. And Stanley Baldwin became Prime Minister of, of the UK. So that's something to think about. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, so just uh, on a slightly arbitrary level here, let's look at lessons for the pandemic. So one of the things that happened in World War One was there was this big discussion about taxation versus borrowing to fund the impact on the economy. And at the moment that we're talking about that now and people are saying we've got to watch it because we won't be able to do levelling up across the regions. And what happened in World War One was it exacerbated class differences because it was very much felt that the wealthy had done all right out of the war. One, they hadn't had penal taxation. For example, there was thought of bringing in a wealth tax or a land tax, and that fell to the wayside. Um, but they and they also got a very generous yield on their investments. So you could argue that, that we're going to have inequality to do with the pandemic. 
in the way that we had inequality with the war. Now, another concept which was introduced in World War I was this excess profits duty. So it might be worth thinking about that in this context. So companies that have done very well out of the pandemic, like Amazon, for example, one could argue not just about paying normal corporation tax, but maybe one could have a sort of pandemic tax to get, get back some of the money they've made out of the pandemic. Trust is vital. The financing plan was already in place. Were the, were the Germans better organised? There was a lot of personal persuasion used, but you had to feel, to buy it, you had to feel that the government would pay it back, regardless of what happened in the war. And, and there was loss of trust, obviously, in, in Germany afterwards. And after hyperinflation, it's quite interesting that the Germans have a reputation even now for buying lower risk securities than other countries because they've got this memory of, of hyperinflation of having their investments wiped out. Keep the design simple. So Germany stuck to a simple funding strategy which made it easy to sell and to understand. Both countries funded around 5% and Britain just made unnecessary complexity, undervalued the freebies it was giving like conversion or using war loan to pay taxes. It allowed possible tax avoidance. It was very messy and probably much more time consuming than the German system. And then the importance of statistics. One of the things in the pandemic is we're getting a lot of statistics and nobody quite knows which are the right statistics to look at. But Germany demonstrated superiority by using statistics. And now we're trying to prove that we're better than other countries in our pandemic statistics. So maybe we can think about the role of manipulation of statistics. So there we are. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. So um, now the floor is open for um, questions from the audience. Um, so uh, let me check the. Uh, yeah, I see there is a question from Paul. Um, yes, I'm yeah, here. Can you hear on. me? Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Janet, for a very interesting um, talk. Um, one of the questions I it, the question is a bit on the periphery, in fact, of your thesis. You have mentioned that the um, Germans didn't have a very well developed um, income tax system. So what I was wondering is, um, given the heavy casualties that occurred in uh, the First World War, uh, when um, <clears throat> German soldiers <clears throat> were killed, presumably pensions were paid to their um, widows. Were those pensions paid out of the um, underdeveloped tax system, or worse, they, did the German government weigh, um, raise war loans in order to pay for those um, pensions? Well, I mean, there was, as well as war loan, there were there was short term debt as well. So they used short term debt or long term, and hope hoped to get the short term debt turned into long term debt. So the, the aim was to fund, yes, as much as I mean, they had, as I said, they had a very limited, the, the reason it was in its infancy was because they'd only just gone from a federal to a national system. So it was very difficult to get everybody to agree to do things because oh, it was right. still relatively federal. Right. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Most interesting talk. Thanks, Paul. Uh... Karin, yes, please go on. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I think there was a lot of uh, propaganda um, on both sides, actually. Um, how do you see that in relation to the pandemic nowadays, if they were to finance uh, the reconstruction or whatever you want to call it, uh, what kind of well, let's call it propaganda. Do you see being used? Well, I mean, I was, you know, you could say, do your. I could imagine a sort of NHS bond. Do your bit for the NHS, or do your bit for the to kill. I mean, the, people have been using wartime analogies for the for the pandemic, haven't they? So you could see, not your country needs you. Your country needs your money to pay for the 
ventilators, you could have touching pictures, you could have campaigns to to raise money, rallies, that kind of thing. Well, you can't have rallies, no. You'd have social distancing for that one. <laughs> but yeah, I think we could. I mean, one of the things that surprised me with this pandemic is how little we've had in the way of posters and and things like that. People say you have to go on the internet to find out what the rules are. And it strikes me we've missed a trip with not having, you know, we have, we have slogans, but we don't really have posters. 